out with and then dip out to go to an appointment. You best wait for the witching hour. Okay, Gareth, you could kick off the live stream, please. We'll uh, we'll make a start then. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the meeting in public of uh, of our our trust board. Uh, welcome to guests that we've got today. Some are observing and and some are participating. You're you're, you're very welcome, and thank you for coming along. Um, and indeed, welcome to the thousands that are bound to be watching us on YouTube. I'm sure we'll be, I'm sure we'll be a, sm a smash hit. Um, we do have uh, a couple of apologies that I'm aware of, and they're apologies because we've we, we've had to uh, send people to other meetings, which are really important. So <clears throat> Rob Cunningham and Sue Harris are attending the the Acute Trust Strategy Day. So it's really important that their contribution and our representation um, at one of our key partners, which is why Sue and Rob won't, won't be with us uh, today. Uh, are there any others that you're aware of? Jill, any other apologies? now okay thank you very much if we move on then to we've got two sets of minutes which we are which we are due to look at and agree or otherwise so could i first refer us to the minutes of the meeting we held on the 14th of september board meeting um, and can anybody indicate whether they have any issues with accuracy or matters arising that aren't going to be covered in today's meeting please no, in which case can we take those as a true record, please? And yet again, Sharon, uh, Jill, thank you very much for the quality of the minutes, which was which was very good as ever. Thank you. Uh, we then move on then to the minutes of the annual general meeting, which was held on the 29th of September. Does anybody have any matters arising or matters of accuracy from those minutes? No, thank you, Mark. No, all, all good. We'll take those as a, an agreed set of minutes then. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, which then takes us to the action log. Uh, now, although the action log, I believe, indicates that all are complete, I'll give anybody opportunity to raise any questions or points of clarification based upon any of the actions down through there. I think they're uh, number eight. Anybody have anything at all? Oh, that makes life not. Hey, if we can keep going at this speed, well, we'll, we'll, we'll be done nice and early. But uh, okay, I, I, I don't. I don't suppose. I don't suppose we will though. Um, I've not been notified of any questions from members of the public. I will look at Jill. Is that the case? As she knows it. That's correct. We haven't had any questions. Okay, thank you. Which um, declarations of interest are all as published on the website, and I remind everybody on the board that should anything change with regard to that, then please inform Jill. Which then takes us on to probably one of the most important parts of our meeting today, which is patient story. Um, I'll hand over to Natalie in a moment. Can I welcome uh, Dr. Katie Powell and Lisa Perry? Uh, to our meeting. Thank you ever so much for coming along. We we believe listening to the patient's story or somebody relaying the patient's story to us is of vital importance to keep board grounded in the reality of what's happening in our trust at the front line on a, on a daily basis. So uh, thank you ever so much for coming along. Uh, and with that, uh, shall I hand over to you, Natalie, to introduce, please. Uh, thank, thanks, Mark. Yeah, so I'll, I'll hand it straight over to, to Katie and Lisa. Um, thank you for joining us today. I know capturing the voice of the young person has been a bit challenging recently, so unfortunately not able to hear directly his voice. But I know um, you'll share his experiences in the wider learning as, as best you can on, on his behalf. So I'll hand straight over to you. Lovely, thank you, Natalie, and um, good morning, everybody. It's um, a real privilege to be able to be here and speak to you about um, one of the patients that I've been working with and tell his story. 
Um, his name's Noah. He's a 14-year-old boy. Um, he was hoping to be with us here, but I'm sure many of you are proud owners of teenagers and know teenagers well, and just how fit quickly things change in a teenager's life. So sadly, he's not able to be here. But I have full consent from Mum and Noah to tell his story. Um, but because we weren't aware that he wasn't coming until fairly late on, um, I've put together a couple of slides and I just want you to bear with me because I've got a few words on slides and I've got some bits of paper from um, my meetings with Noah that I, I'd just like to read out to you. So I'm not very good with IT, but I'm going to attempt to share my screen. So can somebody just please shout out if I've managed to do it, please. Yes, that's, uh, that's shared with us now, Lisa. Lovely, thank you. So um, I want to speak to you about Noah. As I said, he's a 14 year old boy. Noah had been referred um, into CAMS a couple of times um, before we actually picked him up because from many of the referrals that were sent in, um, he didn't actually meet our criteria in CAMS as a tier three service. But what we saw was a building picture of um, a troubled lad who, who needed some support. What was being asked of us was to um, assess Noah for ADHD. So the next three slides that I've got are a bit all over the place because they're extracts of things that Noah, his mum, actually said to me and the school actually said to me. Because in order to assess Noah, I didn't just meet with him. I met with um, his school, his social worker and a range of professionals. So... Some of these, are quite, they're, they're quite hard reading. I appreciate that. Um, uh, and it's very, very sad to hear. So Noah, as I said, he's 14. He told me he hates himself. He's scared of himself. He's always angry. He hurts people for no reason. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he's really scared that actually he's going to hurt or kill himself or somebody else because he just can't keep all these feelings in. His head physically hurts. He's frightened. He's disgusted by what he's come. He's always in trouble. He's always grounded. He can't sit still. He's constantly getting told off. He shouts all the time and he swears at people that he loves. And that breaks his heart. But he just doesn't know how to, as he kept wording it, I don't know how to fix myself. What we heard from Noah's mum was he needs help. He knows he's doing wrong, um, but he can't stop it. And he and she fear what might happen with his anger. He punches stuff, he punches people. Um, as I said before, he wants to hurt people. Sadly, he got himself in a bit of bother with the police. He'd been arrested for common assault. And mum reiterated he can't keep still and he's got really, really poor sleep. He'd been um, participating in some self-harming behaviours. Much of this was superficial scratching, which um, we deal with in cams day in, day out. But um, things had started to escalate a little bit and he'd got the kitchen knife out and um, it was a really, really worrying time for Noah and his mum. In school, Noah's always in trouble. He spends most of his time in isolation and sadly he was on the verge of being permanently excluded from his school. And he'd only been in that school for about a year because um, he hadn't done well in his previous school. So he told me again, I get angry, I swear a lot. Um, I get really bored in lessons, I can't concentrate. I look out the window, I mess about and I'm always, always in trouble. And what school were telling us was, uh, pretty much the same as what Noah and his mum have been saying. Um, he's an erratic, impulsive um, risk taker. He spends a lot of time in isolation. He punches things and people. And he's in a lot of bother for um, recently having assaulted another pupil. So my job was to determine whether Noah had um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, some of you may be familiar with the condition. It's um, often all over the press and it gets a bit of a bad name, really, because it's kind of a pathology for what a lot of people think are naughty kids. But that's something in CAMS we strongly disagree with. Um, <clears throat> so in order to assess Noah for um, ADHD, I had to determine, does he have difficulties with impulsivity? hyperactivity and inattention that causes him, him an impairment across at least two settings for at least six months. And then if the answers to all of those are yes, which I think would agree from the previous few slides, like yes, you know, potentially does meet that diagnostic threshold, we then have to consider, is there another or better explanation for these difficulties? So my assessment with Noah um, went on over a few weeks um, I liaised with many other professionals and saw him in clinic on a few occasions. 
And there were a few things that came up um, in his assessment. The first one was um, some difficulties with learning. No had a diagnosis of dyslexia, or has a diagnosis of dyslexia, but he um, was really, really struggling in school. Was it dyslexia? Was it learning? Was it his behavioural difficulties? Nobody was really, really clear. But what was put to us is that um, in terms of his academic studies, no was mostly on target. He's a very capable young man, but unfortunately his behaviour in school is problematic. I also had to think about his um, early years. And when I work with families to assess for ADHD, I take the assessment right the way back to the beginning. And I'm talking back to pregnancy. And what we heard was, although mum was well throughout pregnancy, Noah was very, very unwell when he was born. He was ventilated for 10 days and he spent a long time in neonatal intensive care unit before he was transferred to the paediatric intensive care. Uh, the first nine months of his life, he spent in specialist children's hospital. He had six surgical procedures and an MRI scan found multiple clots on the back of his brain. <coughs> Excuse me. He remained under the care of the paediatric team for this until he was around seven. Sadly, just before Noah's second birthday, he contracted meningococcal septicemia and mum described three um, resuscitations where Noah was very, very close to dying in that sort of third year of his life. I also think about his physical health, which I've noted on here, because following on from all of these difficulties that he had in his um, first two to three years with his physical health, he continues to suffer. He's got a condition called rapid transient diarrhea um, and short gut syndrome, and he's still undergoing loads of tests at Birmingham Children's Hospital and has to take regular medication for this. I think I remember one particular clinic appointment I had with him and he had to see me one day, the orthodontist the next day and go to the children's hospital the next day. So he was quite pleased with the amount of time he was getting off school that week. Uh, Noah had also previously just moved, well, I say just, he moved school within the, the last 12 months, which may or may not be impacting on some of these behaviours. Um, and I always consider trauma. Oops. So Norman... Noah's trauma was really, really difficult to hear as a professional. Um, and I'm going to share with you parts of it today, but I'm not going to go right into the finer details. If Noah was here and wanted to share that with you himself, so, you know, uh, that that's different. But I feel I'm just going to give you an overview and I've got some bits written down. Um, there's a lot of colourful language in it, which I'm going to try not to use. OK, uh, Noah retold the story of his life with his stepdad. He told me he was nice to start with, but he grew up to be a bully. Once he was confident in our family, he would scream and shout at me. I heard from Noah that his stepdad would frequently assault his younger sister in front of him when his mum was out. In the beginning, Noah's stepdad never assaulted Noah or his sister in front of his mum. He would only ever do it when mum was out. This made Noah really, really angry, very understandably. Um, Noah spoke about an incident where his stepdad manhandled him whilst his mum was out, but sadly he acquired an injury during that time and had to be taken to hospital. And he was told by the adults around him that he mustn't tell the doctors how that accident um, had happened. This abuse went on for a long period of time. Noah spoke to me about hiding in a cubby hole in the kitchen. He used to close the cupboard door when his mum was getting beaten by his stepdad so he couldn't see what, was, well, he could see what was going on, but he needed to be safe and he needed to check that his mum was okay. The abuse continued and fortunately for Noah, um, his his mum um, found, the, found the strength. She was a victim too, there was no escaping. Noah's mum is equally as much as of a victim in this as Noah is and they had moved to a foreign country to live with a stepdad's family and the abuse had grown and grown and grown to to abusing the whole family including sadly the stepfather's uh, relations abusing Noah and his sister too. Fortunately um, mum and the family came back to this country and they um, sought support so in terms of my assessment for Noah I have a big question that I have to ask myself does Noah have attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder or is Noah perfectly ordered in the context of his lived experience? Is the problem within Noah? Does he have a disorder that's within him or is the problem what's happened to Noah? Now, the reality is it could be either or. It could be a bit of both. 
and often we never really truly know, which highlights the importance of such a careful assessment that's individualised. We hear so much about, you know, mass assessment and delivering of uh, mass screening tools and delivering the same programmes to the same groups of people, but NOAA's store is unique. So what we did for NOAA, we did some uh, interventions that were psychosocial in nature, psychological in nature, and we utilised the medical model too. So we liaise closely with the school, with the youth offending team, with um, NOAA's social worker, with his family support worker, with his risk management team. NOAA had some specific psychological work with us in CAMS, with a psychologist, where um, a range of models was used. There was cognitive behaviour therapy, acceptance and, acceptance and commitment therapy and trauma-informed care. And we prescribed NOAA a low dose of methylphenidate to take on his school days only with a view to hopefully support his concentration in school. Now, one of the reasons I speak about this is um, we've got a, a new way of thinking in, in CAM. Since Dr. Powell and I have been in post, um, we've made a lot of changes to the um, ADHD service. So NOAA's intervention at CAMS that was psychological included some of the following things. There was formulation mapping that helped him understand the effects of the trauma on his executive functioning and his emotional management. We don't think that Noah's um, difficulties with concentration were due to ADHD, nor his emotional management. We think that that was likely more down to his trauma. He did some work on oh, sorry, uh, assertive talking. Um, Noah spoke about bottling up emotions and um, he learned to and was given the skills to speak assertively about his feelings. Work was done, we know we're on guilt and shame because what we know about children who've been abused is actually they feel guilty and they feel ashamed. And that's something that we work with very, very closely in CAMS. And we work very, very hard on Noah's core belief system because despite what he believes, despite what he's been told, Noah is not a bad boy. He's not a bad person. So I'm very pleased to say from this triad of um, interventions that was psychosocial, psychological and medical in nature, Noah now has improved interpersonal skills. He's completely ceased sad farming. He's less angry. He doesn't even get into fights anymore. Um, he's got a much calmer home life. He manages to stay in lessons, not just in school in isolation. He manages to stay in lessons and he's doing well in them and he hasn't had any exclusions. He's looking to be discharged from a lot of services because obviously the youth offending team were involved after his arrest um, and the work that's been done in terms of family support will be drawing to an end very, very shortly. Um, we've given Noah some medication, as I said, but Noah keeps telling us and anybody else you'll listen, he's not going to take it for a long period of time. It's just for a little while. And our hope is we'll get him through school and, and see where we're at then. But medication should, should, you know, it shouldn't be a long term solution for Noah because it because it's not the right one. Um, and Noah hopes to become a tattoo artist and he's doing really, really well with um, his drawings. He brings them into cams and shows us beautiful pictures of art that he hopes one day to pop on somebody's skin. So I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview about what our service used to look like so as we can think about what may have happened to Noah before we made the changes. Uh, Dr. Powell and I both started uh, in cams around the same time in August and September 2019, at which time there were 330 children in CAMS on medication for ADHD. Um, and they were often uh, diagnosed following one appointment uh, with one doctor where um, medication was often started. Polypharmacy was commonplace because so many kids were coming in and they were um, having uh, an assessment. Like, do remember, go back to those um, that diagnostic criteria, are they hyperactive, are they inattentive um, and are they impulsive? And if the answer was yes, the diagnosis was given and they were medicated. But so what we do now is we've got a very, very different assessment process where we assess over months across settings and our um, assessment includes making psychosocial interventions, changes to the changes to the things at home, changes to things at school and psychological input where, where required. It may be some counselling or maybe some work with us in camps. So if we fast forward to September 2020, we now only have 217 children um, with us on for, for uh, having medication in camps that we manage. Um, some of those have turned 18. 
Many we've worked to get off medication. Some we've reformulated. I'm, I'm sad to say several we've had to refer to social services and there's been, um, you know, a lot of work with social care um, and some of those children are in care. Um, but we look much more holistically now than this has previously um, happened. So what what's come from this if we've, we've got significantly re reduced poly polypharmacy and um, in turn reduced prescribing um, that you know is in keeping with a lot of the um, trust's hopes about reduction of prescribing particularly melatonin which we used to have kids on high levels of stimulants so they couldn't sleep so they'd be given melatonin so now we've worked with, with all of those things and got this huge reduction and we need to think about the long-term health benefits because what we know about ADHD medication is in the short term it works really well because it would work for any one of us here today but long term, it's got long term health effects. It stunts children's growth. It speeds up their heart. It increases their blood pressure. So we really need to think about the long term health benefits for these kids. We're really proud to say we don't have a waiting list for ADHD assessment at CAMS. If a child is referred into ADHD, uh, uh, referred into CAMS for an ADHD assessment, they are seen within 28 days to determine whether formal assessment is required, or it may just be so that some psychosocial education. Uh, Oh, sorry, psychoeducation is um, is all that's required. And for me, one of the biggest things is that the trauma informed care message is spreading. We're getting the word out across schools, across social care, that actually it's not so it's not about what's wrong with these kids. It's about what they've seen, what they've heard and what's happened to them and working with that. So that's uh, my last slide. So um, I'll switch this off then. And um, are there any questions? OK, okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, and just for board's um, information, Jamie and I had a, a very good and impressive visit over to CAMS in Hereford about two or three months ago, it was. And, and indeed, we met we met Lisa and well, I know Lisa was intent on insurance. She told us all about ADHD and what is happening in Hereford. And it, it, it was quite impressive to hear it all. Um, so thank you, Lisa, for that very powerful example that you've given. Um, I'll, I think, I think Julie was first, but if I, uh, if we go. Thank you, thank you Mark. J Julie first, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that, Lisa. Um, just to put it into context, I'm an enterprise advisor supporting special needs schools here in Worcester, and I'm mentoring children with exactly the example she was just given. And during the last few weeks, I've struggled to understand how the CAMS piece has been fitting into their care. And your step change away from medication, the way you are supplying this bigger picture is an absolute breath of fresh air for me because I'm working with two particularly young teenagers. I absolutely recognise all the behaviours just left out. So for me, knowing we've made that step change and that we are looking at that wider picture will help me make sure that I'm advising these children in these schools to how to go and get that right support as well. So thank you so much for sharing that. It's been really empowering for me. Well, thank you, Julia. I've got Janet, Martin, then Jamie. Janet first, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Um, yes, thank you very much, Lisa and, and Kate. That was, I thought that was very, um, very insightful. Um, I felt I learnt a lot um, and it was quite a difficult thing to hear really. Um, my question's about the change that you've made because obviously you came into post and you've introduced what seems to me to be a fairly dramatic change into a department and I think that's that's down to your clinical leadership which I think is absolutely vital and um, it's a brilliant example of clinical leadership in action. Um, my question is about actually it's the how, um, because you've introduced what seems to be like a major change in and it's had an impact in three years um, and we've had COVID over that time. So you've had people, you know, working remotely. So, 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 and, you, you know, you could probably spend hours telling us, but, but just briefly, how did you manage to do that? Um, because it's a cultural thing, isn't it? I'm happy to have a little go at that one, if you like, Lisa. Um, I, I'm not going to lie, Janet, we were actually aided by COVID. Um, so we knew quite quickly on, I think, when Lisa and I both joined the Hereford team that we had a similar way of thinking um, and we were presented with this caseload, if you like, that nobody wanted to touch, nobody wanted to go anywhere near. And we were like, we, we could do something with this. We can really change this. 
we didn't have the capacity to really do anything other than because previously, as Lisa said, these kids were entirely managed by locum consultants coming in. We just didn't have the capacity. We had planned that we needed some nurses into that team um, and everyone will know the kind of difficulties recruiting medics. So I felt it was my job to start thinking outside the box. It doesn't all have to be done by a consultant. In fact, it's better if it isn't. Um, so we trained Lisa up um, as a non-medical prescriber and Lisa is now also undertaking her advanced clinical practitioner training. We're also in the process of training another two non-medical prescribers and we've um, managed to be lucky to get some money to get a healthcare assistant into our team as well. So we are now building a multidisciplinary team. This all started a fraction before lockdown. Lockdown coming meant that we legitimately could hit the pause button with ADHD because there were papers written that said it really isn't appropriate to assess for a, 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 a neurodevelopmental condition remotely. And when we were prohibited from doing any face to face, we we had legitimately, if you like, had the permission to hit the whole pause button, which gave Lisa and I the time to go right through that spreadsheet, get to know those 300 children, uh, put a plan in place in our, for them all. And then when the restrictions were lifted, we went with it and we didn't start the service back in the same way that we did before. So that's how. Um, so we had all the ideas and then COVID, um, something good has come from it. It just really gave us that opportunity. Um, just before we kind of move on, if it's OK, to, if I can just kind of reference what Julie mentioned. Julie, I think it's really important to hold in mind that this is a Hereford only service at the moment. ADHD is entirely commissioned with community paediatrics in Worcester. Now, maybe that's a little bit why we wanted to come and talk is because, you know, um, I would like to think that there's a different way of doing things in Worcester as well. Um, but obviously it's going to require the same level of permission, if you like, to make those big changes that we had in Hereford. Thank, thanks, Katie. And uh, your, 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 your ask is already noted and I knew it would be there somewhere. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Martin and then Jamie, please. Yeah, there's, thank you. And, and it's really good to see the practical application of the, the, the talks we've had around trauma informed care, that it's actually making a difference on the ground. I just wanted to go back, actually, Lisa, to where you started um, around the, a couple of referrals that didn't meet our thresholds um, it, of being a tier three or tier four CAM service, because the I suppose the number one angst I get from head teachers or 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 or, or, or teaching uh, colleagues is around um, we can't get any help until things are too serious when we cannot manage them. How are we translating this approach down through the other tiers so that we are getting early intervention uh, and and you know only the the really serious tier three and tier four are coming to us, but we've done what we can at, at the lower tiers. Sorry, I'm not sure I'm going to go, Katie. Oh, hi. Do you want to go first, Katie? And I'll... Yeah, uh, I was going to say um, uh, it, it is a bit of a slow process, Martin. And obviously, we are getting out there doing a lot of training. Um, Lisa's very humble, um, but uh, she works hours and hours above what, what she should be. And kind of going out there, um, she's done training days with the Senkos in the school. Um, we have like kind of close links now with the head teachers who kind of now have email communication with us. We've gone out and we've trained the school nursing team as well. Um, we've been out to speak to GP colleagues. So we really are kind of spreading the message through training. Now, in terms of the kind of lower levels, as you mentioned, the sort of tier two. Yes, we've been working with um, our colleagues, the mental health in schools team, um, a little bit less CLD. But now they are starting back again, again, post COVID. We're hoping to sort of link in with them and do a little bit of training. So it is filtering down that kind of trauma informed care. Um, as for kind of not hitting the threshold, that is is always really tricky, isn't it? Because I think when people hear the word CAMS, they think of us, the very small tier three that does the moderate to severe mental health. And they sometimes forget that it's all those other kind of, as I say, you know, primary care intervention, the mental health in schools and things. So sometimes people, 
I think, you know, people, if they don't get accepted into that tier three, there's that kind of, oh, we've been declined by CAMS. But actually, it's not very often we decline with no advice. We usually say, you know what, you're not for our particular little tier three bit, but we think you'd work really well with our colleagues in early help or CLD or that kind of signposting thing. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, then after Jamie, Matthew, please. Well, thanks. Um, thanks both. Uh, a great case study, really fascinating and really interesting discussion from the questions. I wanted to ask about the change process. Janet uh, asked that and you've given quite a bit of explanation, Katie, but just one extra bit to that, if you like. Uh, I wondered what the reaction of your colleagues were was when uh, the two of you came in and started to change things. Obviously, there were other people in the service used to doing things a different way. Could you just say a little bit about how that was handled? What reaction there was? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to go to, to go first on this one. Because of um, staff shortages for a really long period of time before I was in post, it had been vacant. Um, there had been months of pet of kids on medication with no medication review because there um, wasn't a permanent psychiatrist. There were just locum psychiatrists. There was no ADHD nurse. Um, I think you'll all find it quite amusing to hear that I'm the longest standing or serving maybe um, ADHD nurse in Hereford because the post had a really high turnover and burnout rate. Um, so when when we came in, although there was a lot of changes, people were predominantly grateful that somebody's People are coming to do the work, I think it's fair to say, wouldn't you, Katie? Yeah, definitely. I was, I was going to say exactly the same, Lisa. I said I had no challenge because I had no colleagues. Yeah, and I, I think um, I think now it's, it's fair to say, you know, although there was that change, there wasn't... Um, like a huge, in the NHS we often have a huge plans for changes, don't we? But because there was nothing in place at that time, it was almost like pick this up and do something with it, please. Um, and I think our colleagues now frequently speak um, about how the integration between the medical and psychological models is benefiting not just our, our, our sort of ADHD cohort, but across the service. It's really changing the way that we think right the way across CAMS. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we'll move to Matthew and then we'll finish off with Tessa and John. Thank you. I was just, it wasn't a question really, I was just going to say it's, it's a pleasure to see um, a holistic approach applied so skillfully with such good outcomes. Um, you, you really are a credit to your professions and, and fantastic ambassadors for CAMS. Um, I will be speaking to the paediatric leads in Worcestershire as well about um, the progress you've made with ADHD. I think Tessa and then we'll finish with John. Tessa. Um, Matthew's partly answered my question actually because I was going to ask how are we going to make sure that this great piece of work and it is fantastic so um, it's wonderful to hear of a change that's happened and is having such an impact for the young people but with a service that's struggling and that is dealing with this in community paediatrics it just seems like a real opportunity to learn the lessons from Herefordshire CAMS and and ease the burden in um, paediatrics. So it was to ask Matthew how he was going to take it into that um, transformation programme. OK, thank you. And, uh, and Matthew's already given us that. And it's it's great to hear that there are plans to take it in there to try and expand. Uh, John. I think, I think that covers my uh, question, really. Uh, so just to say um, a personal congratulations to you both, because I think you both individually have led on this um, turnaround, if you like, um, improving clinical pathways, looking at new ways of working, new roles, and also um, from what uh, I've heard from you, Lisa, in your summary is continuously looking to the future and expanding the service and looking at new ways of uh, providing that. Um, my question was really, uh, this, this approach is what we need across the organisation. And I'm just wondering whether you are playing any part in the wider children's transformation services at the moment and how we can bring this learning into that. I'll leave that one for Katie because um, I'm not specifically doing anything, but um, Katie might know a little bit more about it than me. <laughs> 
thank you, Lisa. So, yeah, so I am um, actively involved in the transformation project with community paediatrics. Um, and I link in a lot with uh, my colleague, Susanna Fries, who's the clinical director for community paediatrics, who reassuringly thinks along the same lines as Lisa and I, um, but isn't quite yet in a position um, either kind of you know workforce or, or otherwise to be able to implement so where we're at at the moment I think it's fair to say Matthew isn't it is that we're we're sort of gathering the evidence um, it is going to be a big task if you like I feel like we've done a pilot run in Hereford with 300 patients to put it into perspective in community peds they've got 4,000 so it's going to be um, we're going to have to do it a little bit differently because I don't think we can just hit the pause button for 4,000 kids um, however I think we will have to be brave at some point and stop business as usual in order to be able to make a big change like like we have down in Hereford. Thank you, Kate. Could, could I wrap up but ask a, a, one final question, if I may? The, it seems like the NHS and indeed social care has issues between handovers and gaps in systems uh, across the piece. Can I ask what happens when somebody like Noah, for example, who is, who is receiving fantastic support and interventions from yourself, what happens when he reaches an age when the, his age means he doesn't fit the CAMS criteria? What actually happens in terms of how we or anybody carries on giving support? Because I feel sure there are a number of what are then young adults that just because they hit 18, their needs don't particularly change. And I'm keen to ensure that we just don't lose them into the system. And perhaps they may may lose the support and fall backwards in their in their uh, prognosis. So. So we are tackling that a little bit, um, Mark, with the introduction of a new youth team, a youth working team. So they pick up young people who are 17 and a half, um, who are coming for discharge from CAMS, and they will work with them in that kind of mentoring, if you like, linking them in with community, helping them find work, education, apprenticeship, that kind of thing, up until the age of 25. So this is a new project that's just kicked off in CAMS in the last couple of months. Um, so don't really have much to report about kind of success or otherwise but well, I think we're really hopeful for that. Um, some of our young people if they need support with prescribing may hop across to an adult ADHD um, service but of course they are mostly for diagnosis they don't usually tend to hold on to them so from a uh, most of the GPs will pick up the prescribing but you're absolutely right there is a big gap and lots of our young people especially those who may be have other complexities like maybe if they have autism as well and ADHD that there, there is a, a a big hole for them after CAMS withdraws. I don't know Thank if you agree, sir. Yeah and I just one thing um, that that really made me reflect on Mark is is just the importance of early intervention. Currently we're commissioned to assess children for ADHD from the age of seven but often by the time that these kids get to seven, they've got that um, narrative behind them, there's something wrong with them, they're a naughty child, et cetera, et cetera. Psychosocial intervention is the way forward for not just these kids, but most of the kids in camps. Um, and if we can get in there early and we can put a stop to that narrative that we're then naughty, we can give the parents the skills that they need to build the resilience in the children and make sure there's ch teams around these kids that builds resilience, I'm ever hopeful, although maybe a little bit rose tinted, that those services in theory shouldn't be needed as much in adulthood because we can make the changes early on. So I should say I'm a health visitor as well. So I do harp back quite a lot to under fives. Uh, that's that's very optimistic, actually. Uh, the, the two things, the, the, the young adults um, uh, new initiatives that is only just started, uh, and also how you're now having earlier interventions that, that that fills me with optimism around this service actually and if I may this is a great example I think of how issues and problems within our service is the people that deal with them on a day out day, day in day out basis know what the issues are and you've really grabbed hold of it and come up with a solution and made things better um, driving it from the ground up rather than the other way around which we know it you, the way you're doing it is is obviously far better and it's 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 very impressive so first of all thank you for undoubtedly going above and beyond i've got little doubt that the two of you would have that's the only way these things happen is through passion motivation and determination 
and indeed I suspect on occasions going around through over uh, under barriers that perhaps were put in the way and you find ways of getting around them so so thank you for doing that and uh, I think it says a little bit about our culture as well that 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 this has happened and John and Natalie and Natalie's predecessor have created the culture where this type of thing can actually happen and I, I, I hope it's happening elsewhere so thank you very much for your very powerful presentations uh, uh, today uh, it, it chimes with what Jamie and I heard uh, when we came and visit you so uh, so thank you lisa thank you kate for coming and uh, good luck with your continuing training on your acp route uh, lisa i wish you all, all all well in that and thank you very much indeed thank you thanks everyone goodbye thank you Bye -bye now. Uh, we now move to the chief executive's report but before i hand over to sarah i'd like to on behalf of board publicly congratulate sarah on her honorary fellowship, which has just been recently awarded by the University of Worcester. Um, these things aren't bestowed lightly, and it's recognition of Sarah's 40 year plus commitment to the NHS. Sorry to say 40 year plus, Sarah. Um, but uh, and also in particular, Herefordshire and Worcestershire and her close liaison with the university and support for the university. And it's a, although it's a personal accolade, undoubtedly, I think it reflects well on everybody in the trust and how they support Sarah and indeed the university and the liaison we have. So congratulations on that, Sarah. And, and, and with that, hand over to you for your report. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have to say it was an honour and it was particularly lovely to receive the award at the same day that all of the nurses graduated. So that was great. A bit full circle for me. So that was lovely. Apologies, there's a van outside my office, which is quite loud. Um, right. I just want to pick up on some of the national elements of my report first. And the first two things I want to draw out are on page four of the report, 45 are diligent, which are around two um, pieces of learning, which although they're not related um, the first one isn't related to our services there's a lot of wider learning so just to note first that the there has a, been a report published called reading the signals which was the independent investigation into maternity and neonatal services in east kent so although the report focuses on those maternity and neonatal services there is some wider learning for boards and there's some key principles came out of the report around the importance of listening to patient experience the importance of responding with compassion and kindness and the importance of having a listening and responsive culture and you'll see in my report there are four areas of action um, for all trusts to consider one is about getting better with identifying poor performing units and that's particularly pertinent for us because we've had a lot of conversations as a board about how we best do that and how we make sure we pick up on early triggers where units are struggling and then as you'll see in the report it's about compassion and kindness team working with common purpose and responding to challenge with honesty so some really important learning from that report um, the second significant piece of learning in the report is around um, the panorama programmes around Edenfield in Manchester. And board will know we've already had a number of discussions around what that um, what that report and that investigation showed and, and what the learning might be, particularly focused on closed cultures and how you prevent a closed culture and make sure you pick up on early warning signs. Um, we've had some discussions around that and we're going to build in some of the learning around that report into the improvement plan for inpatient mental health we've got. We've talked quite a bit about Hillcrest and the specific action plans we've got to respond to some cultural issues at Hillcrest Ward in Redditch. Um, but there's also much wider learning for inpatient mental health. So um, Mark, Matthew is leading a programme of work around the improvement plan for inpatient mental health and we'll draw in all the learning from Edenfield into that conversation. There's also about to launch a national quality programme for inpatient mental health units which Natalie's uh, and Matthew are cited on and as that comes out I think that will also give us a really helpful framework to make sure that we're picking up on all of the key priority areas. Um, just to note both of those reports any learning from both of those situations will go through Q&S um, in due course. I just want to note on page five, the winter planning letters. So we've had um, a winter planning letter confirming areas that we need to focus on as a system as we go into winter. That includes increased bed capacity, a community falls service, um, flow out of hospital, um, reducing ambulance conveyance, increasing staff vaccination, as well as a system control room. So just to assure the board that all of those pieces of work in the winter letter are being progressed as we speak, we are looking at whether we can add additional beds 
to the community hospital bed stock. That is already a challenge because we already have 12 surge beds, but we're, we're looking at um, refining a plan which would introduce another six beds. You'll all be familiar with um, references to boarding in community hospitals. We don't use that term because we feel very uncomfortable with people who are living with frailty, older people who are living with frailty, um, being in a situation where they're being cared for in a completely inappropriate environment without the requisite core services. So we very much want to focus on where we can put additional beds, where we can make sure somebody's observed, has a call bell and has the appropriate level of care. So just for the board to be aware, that's a live conversation again at the moment um, as we speak. I've mentioned the NHS England operating framework. It's worth a read. It's actually um, presented as a presentation, but it does make it very clear that whilst the provider trusts have a responsibility to contribute to system working and system strategy delivery, we it's also very, very clear that we retain our responsibility around finance and quality um, at the same time. And that primary responsibility of a trust remains. It, it's quite helpful. It just explains what NHS England will do, what the ICB will do and what's expected of providers. So useful as a reference point. Um, there's also been some national guidance issued around delegation and how NHS bodies can delegate some of their functions to others. This is particularly relevant for the mental health collaboration. So we're particularly looking at it in that light at the moment to see what this framework can um, support us with as we move forward um, to progressing the collab. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those national ones because there's obviously quite a lot. Just to draw out on page eight, the independent inquiry into childhood sexual abuse has been published. And clearly there's some quite alarming findings and a number of recommendations in that. So we will need to take that through our safeguarding um, groups to consider any wider learning for us around that area. And just finally, on the national piece, um, you'll be aware of the potential strike action. Um, a number of the healthcare professional unions are balloting at the moment um, to see if, if staff are open and willing to strike. We're expecting an update on that at some point this week. Um, we have looked at our business continuity plans and we're taking quite a lot of action to prepare for this. But what I suggest is when I get to the end of the report, Mark, if I may, I'll just ask Matthew to say a little bit more about that, just so the board can hear exactly what we're doing around potential strike action. Just moving on to the system updates then, um, just to note that the first meeting of the Integrated Care Partnership Assembly took place on the 7th of October. That was a really positive meeting, very much setting the context though for how the Assembly is going to work as we move forward. Moving into specific trust updates, I just want to highlight care notes. Um, board are all well cited on this fact, but I think we just need to publicly share again what a risk this is for our system. Um, as we know, the Care Notes electronic patient record went down on the 4th of August. We still are without that record and we have our interim arrangements with Thea in place. <clears throat> At the moment, um, the best information we have suggests that um, we will have the opportunity to potentially go live again with Care Notes around the end of November, but that is completely subject to testing um, from our digital team to make sure we're confident it's all safe and ready to go. And also some preloading of patient information so that the teams can get back on track. Um, so just need to note that that is still a major risk for us in terms of day to day business and the staff have all been absolutely amazing managing with this, but it is it is adding significant work. Um, just to note, HALT, we um, we have successfully opened the new HALT ward, which is part of the eliminating dormitories work. Um, it looks fantastic for anyone who hasn't been yet. Um, just the difference the environment makes is, is incredible. And patients definitely are saying that having your own ensuite bedroom is making such a difference in terms of them having some private space and, and time to reflect if they want to and not being in sort of a, a busy enclosed ward. So much bigger social space is really positive feedback so far from staff um, and patients which is fantastic and Jenny Lind in Hereford is the next ward that will is due to open so the program is continuing. Um, I've also mentioned a couple of um, just positive news that's going on in the trust including our staff awards which you were all at and just finally just want to note at the end of my report on page 11 just to confirm that Jamie Morris non-executive director has had his term of office extended to the 6th of November 2023 which is really positive so for the board to formally note that we're delighted Jamie um, and just to formally note that um, in the record thank you Mark happy to take any questions
Uh, should we go? Should we go to Matthew? First? Oh, sorry. Do you want to go to Matthew? Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. go to Matthew, and then we'll we'll take questions. Matthew. Thank you. Um, so we've set up an internal industrial action group um, with the aim of mitigating the effects of, of strike action. Um, we're also part of a system um, group with with action coordinated across uh, group members as well. Uh, so both those uh, groups are meeting at the moment. We're meeting every 10 days fortnightly, but obviously as, as as action becomes imminent, we'll move to a control and command model. And we've produced a, a trust plan, um, which is around service prioritization, prioritization and, and redeployment. So we divide all services into three categories and our system partners done the same, which are run. So these services have got to keep running. Slow, which is we, we can make some changes to these services. We don't have to provide the full services and stop, which is these services could be stood down if they need to and staff redeployed. And we're also focusing each service around uh, critical delivery activities, so normal uh, business continuity stuff. Um, obviously, in terms of impact, we have got 800 um, plus RCN members in this organisation, so potential impacts large. Um, we're being proactive as much as we can within the legislation framework. So it is our intention to approach and ask um, individual staff members whether they intend to come out for strike action um, and plan accordingly around that. Obviously, the risks that we've got um, still outstanding are unpredictability. So it's lawful to refuse to disclose your intentions, although, of course, we can ask, as I said, and non-union members can also come out on strike, um, strongly mitigated, at least in the RCN's case, by the RCN's stated intention, they will avoid patient harm, obviously, and our uh, negotiation of derogations uh, with staff side with whom we're in ongoing discussions. Thanks, Matthew. Does anybody have any questions, or points of clarification from either what Matthew referred to or Sarah's report. Jamie. I just wanted to ask Sarah, um, going back to the uh, guidance on delegations and the implications of that, because I wasn't sure whether this suggested NHSE were dragging their feet again on delegations that might apply to the Mental Health Collaborative. I suppose on the other hand, uh, there's not a lot that we would be prevented from doing without delegations. Uh, and also there's quite a bit that would need to be done uh, in terms of the key area of risk, uh, section 117, before we took any delegations. So I wondered whether you thought this was a overall an, um, an, a negative thing or a neutral thing for the, for the collaborative. Um, I think it's fairly neutral in a way, Jamie. I think it just gives you um, a steer on some of the models of delegation that could be employed. And it might help, actually, if we've still got concerns about Section 117 costs. Um, but actually, we're quite happy to take delegation on other areas. It gives you almost a framework to do that. It also gives you a few options of how ICB um, staff or... Um, not supervision, but, you know, how the ICB could be connected with the collaborative, a few different ways we could do that. So I think it's helpful. I, I don't think it's strongly suggesting one option or another. It's just saying these are ways you could consider um, taking on the delegated function. So it's it's a discussion document, really, that will inform the delegation document that we uh, we develop. And Tessa. Thank you, Mark. A question for Matthew, actually, regarding the potential um, strike action. Matthew, what's the position for individual staff if they go on strike? Do they lose the day's pay for the days that they're on strike? Um, yes, they do. No, I'm, I'm not personally sure. Perhaps Elaine can come in on this. Um, if they lose the complete day's pay, whether they receive zero pay or whether they receive a proportion they yeah, yeah, they receive a proportion, but um, yeah, it does impact on them. And we'll be yeah. recording that via uh, ESR as well. Yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering whether the current cost of living crisis was going to have an impact on staff and whether they understood the consequences to their own individual income if they take strike action. So I was just curious. Thank you. Um, Thank what you. I would what I would say, um, Tessa, is... And whilst they do lose pay, 
uh, they do have the opportunity to still do agency work, just not in our trust. That's an interesting scenario, uh, Elaine, which we'll, yes. we'll, we'll leave yeah. there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, if I've got no other questions, um, I think that's a historic hand, Jamie, I think. Um, just just a comment, really, the, the winter pressures were put in Sarah's paper there and we're looking down the barrel of obviously unknown flu season. Most commentators say at least one, if not two COVID waves between now and next March. The potential for industrial action, uh, we already know higher acuity for patients uh, ac across the piece in a very challenged system, especially in Worcestershire. So the next few months are not going to be very easy at all for our staff and for our for our uh, our teams that are planning to get through this. So uh, so good luck with all of it. And I know you'll keep board informed as to anything we can do as a board to assist or any decisions that need making. So uh, thanks for that, Sarah. If we move on then to please, uh, Jill and the Board Assurance Framework and High Risk Register. Yeah, so um, obviously board members will be aware that we have been trialling um, some new systems around our uh, risk management generally and um, certainly of the last the previous board meeting in the last committee cycle we've adopted the seven levels of assurance and so there has been quite a focus in undertaking some training for uh, people who are going to be using that writing reports um, uh, for both committees and board and we're looking to build on each round that we undertake actually tweaking some of the systems because I think it is very much an iterative process. What we have here is the board assurance framework and you'll note the updates in red and um, we have uh, uh, undertaken a bit of a, a refresh and um, it's very easy when you see the board assurance framework on a regular basis to almost uh, just glance over it and so we have tried to do a little bit of a, a, a deep dive into it and have a look and so that's why there's probably more uh, changes to the BAF this month and um, we've seen um, perhaps uh, more frequently. Um, what we also have uh, in the report are uh, the new style of reporting of the summary of the top new risks um, that have emerged. I think there is some work in terms of some of those that actually on the face of the narrative that's provided, I'm not sure that uh, I would have automatically said that they're at the level that's been identified. And so uh, we'll pick those up individually with the risk register owners, because I think we have got a little bit of a disconnect between things that might be quite significant for an individual service, as opposed to is this sufficiently significant for us organisationally, which obviously should be how uh, the scoring works. And so I certainly will pick up some of the risks that are um, the, certainly the new top risks that appear to be very much service specific rather than um, organisational risks. And we've also included, uh, we're building the trend data to look at how risks do change over a period of time uh, in terms of the different appendices that are attached. I am conscious that we have been changing the style of reporting for risk management and the board assurance framework. And so if any board members have any feedback, if they want to just get in touch with me individually, that would be appreciated to see as to whether this is actually a useful way of presenting um, rather than obviously how we, we've presented in the past. Um, I don't think I wanted to say much more. We are hoping that um, in next month we are going to be having a session on risk management actually looking at a couple of uh, specific case studies as part of our uh, board development um, so I'm happy to take any questions on either any of the higher level risks or the board assurance framework although I might need some colleagues to help with some of the specific higher level risks. Thank you Jill and thank you for you and to all for the work that's gone into this. Does anybody have any questions at all before um, I, I like to think myself as an optimistic person, but I've got to be honest, I read through this paper and, and, and I struggled to pick myself up because it's, it just references 
the the difficult environment in which the NHS is in, basically, and it and it brings it home, which of course it should do to us as board. Uh, and the the new risk that you highlighted, the top risk there, Jill, I, I think do that uh, in spadefuls actually. Um, but we need we need to be realistically sighted on this and and hopefully manage it moving forward. If nobody's got any questions, can we approve the amendments to the BAF as highlighted uh, by Jill there in, in red? OK, so they're all approved. Thank you. And when we come to the end, towards the end of the meeting, we'll be re returning to this to check that that uh, our meeting has covered substantially the items within the BAF, which is in a way what we're here for. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll move now to the strategy and partnerships paper because we've asked Sue to go to the acute uh, strategy meeting. Then I think Sarah is going to present this one. Is it you, Sarah? Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, so the paper's in two parts. The second part is the normal report that Sue would present to you at board that covers the main programmes of work that we manage through the PMO. Um, Part one, though, is perhaps the key bit. So we recently had a board development session, you'll recall, and we had a discussion about whether the biggest long term transformation and improvement projects were visible enough in the report and the way it was presented. So they're in there, but they were a bit lost because it was a much broader report about a lot of issues. So um, at the board development session, we task Sue to propose the big the big programs of work that that have the more significant transformational change and agree a way that they could be more prominent and the report could be structured more focused on them so you can see in the report um sorry i can't see the page number but it's 76 on diligent um the table on that bottom of that page and the top of the next page proposes six key areas that we feel as directors we would like to put forward as the main priority programs for um the biggest focus from the um strategy and partnership report moving forward so that includes attraction and retention um our community home first and urgent care um, children young people transformation improving the clinical model for adult mental health inpatient services um responsive and resilient community mental health and iapt transformation so those are the areas that we're proposing um if we're looking for a decision from board. Are you comfortable those are the key ones that you want more line of sight and detail on through the board reports? If they are, then Sue will adapt the report and we'll have the new version from January. So today what we're looking for is board comment on whether you're happy those are the key areas to focus on. It, obviously, there's then a long list of, of programmes, which is on page 77 of Diligent, that will still be overseen through the PMO process. And we can still report on those if there are escalation points, but it's really about whether we're happy to focus on those core priorities in the reports uh, moving on from January. So um, open to comments on that, Mark. Yeah, if we pause there then, colleagues, if we could, th those are the items, a, a bit of a result, really. I, th I, I think I said to Sue, no more than five, please. And, and to get six, I think is a result because I, I was expecting more priorities to, to come forward. So, But I do think they hit the major things that we as a board should be looking at. Has anybody got any comments or, or different opinions on, on what's been presented as the six? Jamie? I like them and I like the approach. I think this is a really helpful way of encouraging us to provide, to ensure real focus on these. I just, I was expecting something on urgent care. That, that, um, there must be a, a rationale for why that's not included. What What am I missing? No, it's there, Jamie. It's under it's called Community Home First because the programme for urgent care across the system is called Home First. So okay, the thanks. urgent care piece and, and crisis, et cetera, um, virtual wards, UCR to our response, it will all be in that category. OK, uh, and just a, a minor point of detail, really, for the table, the children's services transformation is being reported through Finance and Performance Committee as well. That's just uh, missed off. Thank, thanks, Jamie. And uh, and you're right to if if urgent and emergency care isn't isn't visible in the work that we're doing, it, it, it should be. And obviously, Sarah's pointed out where it is there, because although it might not be right at the top of our list in terms of 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 very internal trust things, it's certainly the top of the list of the system where we play a, a huge part in our contribution to that. So it's it, that that's one of the reasons why it's uh, it, it's on that list of six. Janet. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to echo what Jamie said. I think this is this is a really good list, and I think it will really help us to focus on what's important. Um, so so really welcome it. And I got a little tiny weeny question just to put me out of my misery. At the bottom of page seventy seven, you refer to something called BUR, and I have struggled and tried to work out what that might be. So can you just tell me? Because <laughs> there may be other people sitting around the table who also wondered. Hopefully. Oh, I've forgotten the acronym now. Rob will tell me. It's the um. Best use of resources. Best use of resources. I couldn't remember what the U was for a second. It's the financial recovery plan. It's the ICS um, and system and efficiency. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much. And I can Sorry. see other people smiling Slip too. So mind. hopefully it wasn't just me. Thank you. And I'll, I'll pick up the urgent care piece, Mark, because we perhaps can make that much more explicit on the list. Thank, thank yeah. you, Sarah. If there's nothing, I did have one question, but I can't tell you from where it comes from in this paper because the paper started to get rather lengthy, didn't it, after this, this key bit. And it was the fact that, I think it's probably one for Matthew Stroke Elaine, is the um, neighbourhood mental health transformation staffing levels in Herefordshire are really healthy in, in the context in which we're in. And in Worcestershire, they're quite unhealthy in the context we're in. I wondered if you were able to comment on, on, on why that is the case. And is there anything that we can, you know, is there some good practice in Hereford or is it just that they're bedded in? What, what might it be, Matthew, to create those changes? I mean, some of it's just time. So we started the, I mean, the, the service has been rolled out in two phases. So um, West Worcestershire and Herefordshire was phase one. That's substantively recruited too. We went through this, all of this in Herefordshire as well. So we have the same types of groups of staff who, who didn't like the new model and, and, and left and joined other services. And we gradually recruited and, and as you recruit more, people have more confidence in the team and, and want to join it and feel more stable. Um, there probably is um, an element to which we have already fished the pool. So everybody who wanted to be in a new neighbourhood mental health team in Herefordshire and Worcestershire may have already joined the phase one teams. Um, our work going forward um, is around reprofiling the workforce. We had two meetings yesterday with NHS England. Um, we are at the moment doing what's called a uh, caseload stratification. So we're looking at all the people who may want to use a mental health service and trying to match those with the types of professionals who'd be most helpful to see them. And as a result of that, we're in discussions with voluntary sector and system partners about different roles and different ways of deploying a service. Thank you. Uh, John, did you wish to comment? Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, just on page 77 of Diligent, um, we have we are saying that eliminating dormitories is not on the priority list. However, we have mentioned developing modern inpatient therapeutic facilities by 2023 on the priority list. So I think it is in the priority list and possibly should be because of the scope of the project and the financial risk around it for the trust. Looking I think it's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it is it there by implication, but not not? Um, so are you saying it's part of the list, but it's not showing predominantly? Well, yeah. It it is it it is in both lists. That's my point. So we are saying developing modern inpatient facilities is in the priority list, but also we are saying that it's not in the priority list. That makes sense. I think what Sue was trying to articulate is the capital program element is won't be part of this report unless there's an escalation point because that will go through F and P as usual. But the transformation that that environment can present in terms of the care we offer would be part of this list because it's about the um, how we improve the clinical model. So yeah, it is indirectly on both, John, but probably with a different angle. Um, on the main list, it's as part of that transforming and improving the clinical model and how the new environment can enable that. I think when Sue put it's not included, I think she meant the formal capital programme um, and the programme of building work and where we are in terms of progress on that, which goes to F&P. Um. Okay, hopefully that, that explains. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, Jamie, historic hand, or you come back in again? I had a question on the, the the latter part of the report, but uh, sh shall I wait? No, no, no. I think it looks like it's the last question. We'll take that and then we'll go to approvals. OK, so it's, it's either for um, Matthew or for Sarah, but in the update on page 88 of partnership work, I was just struck reading the difference between the approach taken in 
Worcestershire, the Worcestershire exec to one Herefordshire. Now, that's obviously a good thing, reflecting local circumstances. But one of the things that Worcestershire is doing is developing a district wide approach um, using the geography of the district councils. And there's a lot of focus on district localities within the county, which is great. But there doesn't seem to be anything equivalent in Herefordshire, even though it's a, an enormous county of great diversity, especially between town and rural. And, and I wondered if if there was w what's being done to reflect that, the, those differences, because they, they don't have district council. They, they never have. Well, they haven't done for 25 years. So Herefordshire has always has for the last 25 years been treated as a big county without necessarily subdivisions within it. And I'm not sure that's the right approach if we're trying to get as, as much of a localised, customised approach. What do you think, Sarah or Matthew? Is there something yeah. in Herefordshire that's developing that? I, th I think it's um, it's just a sli slightly different structure to meet the local needs because Hereford has the smaller population, as we know. But yeah, one Herefordshire includes a programme called Talk Communities, which is in a way very similar to the work going on in the district collaborative. So Talk Communities is very much at looking at that very local population, looking at neighbourhood working, if you like, um, across agencies. So they're building on Talk Communities as part of the one Herefordshire programme. Obviously, they don't have the same kind of infrastructure in terms of the district collaborative groups we do that because of the number of um, district councils in Worcestershire and the need for us to have that more local focus because of the size and population size in Worcester and the variation but yeah the variation the population health and the community level response is present in both but they're just um, enabled in a slightly different way. Matthew did you wish to offer a comment on that? Um, yeah just to say that that um, obviously that there are five uh, PCNs in Herefordshire, we work and have worked with the PCNs in the production of their um, local health plans. So each of those is is modified to include local mental health needs around that PCN area. And we've also adapted our um, neighbourhood mental health team model in Herefordshire in response to um, local GP feedback. So what you see in all um, five PCNs in Herefordshire is slightly different according to local need negotiated with PCN leads. Thanks, Matthew. OK, this paper, I think, thank you to Sue in her absence for capturing what I think board was asking for, which is to disassemble the top priorities from the priorities, in essence, to ensure that board was regularly cited on the top priorities and how we're doing in those programmes, which this does. So it, it helps us to focus, which is what um, our board development is all about, really. Can we agree those six areas and the fact that they will be brought back regularly to board for us to take oversight and assurance on progress? Yes, everybody's for there. Thank you very much indeed. Consider that approved. If we move on then to the uh, assurance reports from our subcommittees, and the first one is QS, Janet. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Um, so this is the first report um, from QS in the new format using the new. Um, seven levels of assurance. Um, I don't intend to go through all of the um, all of the aspects and every single level because I think um, it, would, it would involve actually rerunning the committee. Um, but what I would say is that for the summary quality report, which is actually on the agenda later on, um, the various sections of that um, were divided up and we looked at each section individually for levels of assurance. And as you can see, um, actually within the report, um, we had different levels of assurance for different aspects, um, which I think is I think is right, the right way to do it. I think it would have not been possible to do that before. And I think it's it's interesting to reflect that in the past we actually looked at an assurance level for the whole report. Um, and I think this actually gives us a lot more, it gives much more granularity um, at the different different aspects. So I was going to make that comment. Um, I was also going to comment on on two of the areas that we we scored at level two, um, because obviously that's the level. Um, which you know requires significant action, and that was the mental health transformation update um, and the safe staffing six monthly report. Um, and I think that was because of really the fact that actually um, we've got um, actions identified and agreed, um, but actually it's it's at the moment we have no um, no no impact really or very little impact um, evident from the actions that are taken. So we're still there's still considerable work to be done on that. 
Um, and then we also had a report from the ICB around out of area placements um, that was initially proposing quite a high level of assurance, I think from memory a level four or level five. Um, and in fact, the discussion at the committee was such that actually we were still in, in information seeking mode, I think, um, and that made it inappropriate really for us to, to give a level of assurance at that stage. Um, so I think you've obviously all read that, read the report. So as I say, I wasn't going to go through it line to line, but what I was going to reflect on the fact was the fact that actually having the new levels of assurance meant that we had a much more in-depth discussion um, around the papers um, that was was less less focused on, if you like, the detail operationally and more focused on actually whether the problems have been identified, whether there was an action plan um, and whether outcomes were actually being delivered um, against that action plan. And I think we all agreed that that was actually uh, really useful um, and something which we, you know, we think as we as we go through the process, um, as Jill referred earlier, it's an iterative process. We will actually, um, you know, we will actually find it even more useful um, as we can reflect back on how things how things have changed. Um, then the other other thing I was going to say is that for future reports, I'm hoping to steal from from Steve's finance report um, with the colour coding um, because actually that's excellent. Um, so I hope you don't mind, but I think that's probably something which, um, and I can see Tessa nodding as well, um, that if we adopt that, it will make it a lot easier for us. So thank you very much. Janet, Thanks, I'd Jane. like to claim some kind of credit, but I really can't. Um, you'd have to look elsewhere for that. I wonder where that might be. Would it be Rob, do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I can only echo those. As somebody that didn't attend those meetings, I found it particularly useful to enable me to focus on the bits that need the focus. And Steve's in particular, when you go, oh, there's the red bits, right, what's that all about? Um, and uh, I think that's the whole idea. It's not about the numbers, but it, it's about focusing in on the priorities and where we need to use our collective uh, knowledge and experience to improve things. And so I, I find the reports particularly good for that. Uh, if there's no questions, can we uh, can we note Janet's report and then move to workforce? Workforce, Tessa. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to say ditto almost to everything that Janet has just said. Um, the discussions were the most interesting thing, I think, about the reports that we received for assurance, because actually we did get into um, talking about what evidence we were getting for the reports. Um, and I think that's why both the workforce element and the safe staffing elements we scored as level two. We could see lots of work was being done. There were action plans and things in the pipeline, but it was too early to be able to see any outputs and indeed any sustained outcomes. So that's why those scored at level two. Um, the other two reports that we gave assurance on were the violence and aggression and the annual security reports, which were both level four. Um, whilst the report says there were no other reports for decision or information, we did have other business on the agenda. And just for board's uh, information, we received the professional regulation of clinicians report, which is always very reassuring as well as assuring, because it shows that we're monitoring and intervening where necessary for professional regulation. And the other report to just mention in passing, we had um, uh, the rainbow badge assessment report and we also received a verbal update from our head of EDI, who's just back from maternity leave. So has come back to receive that report and to start looking at the actions that are required to move us forward in that process. So a lot of work will be required. But just to say um, the initial assessment is a really useful tool to show us the breadth of the work. And indeed, some of the work has already been started around policy reviews and so on. Um, and I'm very happy to take any other questions. Was any questions for Tessa at all? I, I think what came out of when I, when I bolted together reading all these assurance reports is, is evidence. And there, I know a few areas where things are probably happening, but if they're not evidence, then it can't be shown, uh, can't be can't be taken by the committee. So I think it's it's all part of the bedding in process. 
uh, and as our, our teams and executive get used to the requirements of the new assurance model, there'll be a requirement for a slightly different type of report to ensure that things are evidenced if they know they're happening. And so I suspect there's some there's some bedding in to, to, to go to go on. And as Tess has indicated, it's the discussions that are important. And just for a look forward in mentioning EDI, Tessa, um, our head of EDI will be coming along to our December board development meeting to discuss EDI with us. Uh, I did have one awkward question, though. Um, I was hoping to have a, a report back on freedom to speak up and deep dive. Can you update us on that at all, please? Yes, um, the freedom to speak up was due to come to the December workforce committee. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're there's work happening, but I'm not convinced that we've yet got a re really clear scope for the deep dive that was happening. We've recently received some, I think it was regional benchmarking information about the yeah. levels of um, freedom to speak up and whole time equivalents and so on, which will be part of and help us to look at the capacity element of that. And I know that Elaine and Nirai have done a couple of um, drop in sessions to try and promote freedom to speak up, um, certainly around Hillcrest and again in Hereford. But actually, we need to do a piece of work around that. By chance, I um, was asked to take part in the Schwartz round yesterday, which is a regular event. And I was amazed to hear it had been going on for seven years now. Um, and I took the opportunity there to say to people, you know, if you are facing difficult and challenging things at work, don't forget we've got freedom to speak up because um, it, it's a very useful tool for people to use to deal with things. So. Um, I think there's more to be done, uh, Mark, and I think we need to bring a really clear um, scope for this. And I think there is an issue around who's going to actually complete the deep dive, because I am convinced that Narai has not got the capacity to do that work alongside her clinical role and her freedom to speak up role, which we have to remember is very part time. So I'm picking up. I think Elaine and I have got a meeting possibly next week and we'll pick that up and we'll make sure that we've got a clear scope for this deep dive and certainly an update on progress made so far for December. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, if there is an issue around resourcing, I'm sure Sarah and Elaine will have conversations about how that can be uh, how that can be dealt with. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, if we can note that report and, and, and we'll move on to the, the colour coded report uh, from from Steve. Thanks, uh, Mark. Um, it, it's possible to focus on red, uh, I think, but I just wanted to refer you to um, the IAPT recovery plan that, that sits at uh, level five. And the reason being is that um, it's it was a really good case study in presenting evidence around why you'd put a, a, it at a, an assurance level of five, but also the level of work that's going into um, uh, that recovery plan, despite the huge demands on the service, it, it is it is a good read and we should congratulate the team on the grip that they've got around it and the, the approach that they're taking. So I just thought that was worth highlighting. On, on those where there's red, um, they're more about timing. Um, they're early plans. The Children's Recovery Report, I mean, it's a massive piece of transformation. Um, it, it really is a, a longer term uh, requirement. So uh, we signed a level two uh, because of the early stages and, and obviously uh, we look forward to seeing uh, greater levels of assurance um, particularly next year once the initial phase of discovery has been completed and we move into to actions. O on the inappropriate uh, out of air replacements again it's, it's early stages um, uh, we've got assurance that there's certainly actions there that will have a, 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 an impact, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that as an organisation, we sit rather well um, by comparison to others. Uh, that said, there's obviously a determination to improve in that particular area. And the only other thing I was going to mention is the CAMS waiting times. Um, it, it's obviously, we didn't assign any assurance just simply because we, we wanted to see firmer um, actions that that you could understand where the evidence 
um, and the impact was going to be made around those actions. So hence that's going to come back uh, and we can assign a level of assurance that thereafter, but happy to take questions on on the, the rest. A uh, question from Martin. Thank you. And, and I, I just want to comment, really, it could have been on any one of these three reports because these assurance levels are, are, are really helpful. But I think it might be something we need to do a, or consider an audit committee is picking up the correlation of those scores across the piece. So my sort of question when we get the Children's Services Recovery Report being read, are we content that that is purely a financial f and p issue and and it's still we're still assured around our um quality of services and the workforce positions as, associated with that so i think it's, it's comment particularly on this report but it's how we correlate and triangulate those three pieces and, and perhaps something that we we should pick up jill around audit committee at bringing those elements together yes sir. <coughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, Martin, I think that's a really important issue. And I know that in uh, workforce and quality and safety, the safe staffing report comes to both. And we were able to, during the committees, co correlate where we were at. And we knew what we'd scored in the workforce committee around the workforce work that needed to be done. But then we were also able to assign assurance levels and it was the same level because of the impact of that on the quality of patient or the potential impact of that on the quality and safety of patient care. I think the children's transformation programme is an interesting one because at the moment it's being tracked um, particularly through finance and performance. But what I would expect to see as it moves forward is work coming out of that around workforce redesign and transformation of the workforce that's needed to make the services um, safe and effective going forward. And then that would need to come as a report to the workforce committee for us to pick up the workforce elements. So I think this correlation across the three main committees is going to be vital. Thank you, Tessa. Can we can we note the report then from Mark, from can Steve? I just make sorry oh, can yes, I just certainly make, sorry I didn't, yeah, didn't sorry, see just one quick comment I think uh, whilst it um F&P uh, uh the name suggests we we we're focusing on on those those uh, finance and performance issues I, I and mean, when we're considering these reports of course we're we're looking at the actions in the broadest sense because we need to understand whether they're going to have the the impact. So I think you're right, Martin, and I think it's incumbent upon us as as committee chairs to make sure that there is crossover. And if we need to chat with each other on uh, stuff that um, doesn't necessarily fall within our remit, but falls to other committees, then we've got to, we've got to chat as chairs uh, in that regard. Thanks, Steve. Can we can we note FNP report? Yes, thank you. Um, they're the three reports that, that Jill and the team have, have, have asked us to use the new seven levels of assurance. And when I read the reports, I thought it, it looked as though it was going OK because it was focusing in the right areas. But having heard your discussions and these discussions, it's reinforced that to me. So it does seem as though it's, it's progressing in the right direction and enabling us to focus on our priorities and focus on the key elements of the various aspects that the, the, the committees receive. We'll continue to we'll continue to um, review, um, and I believe we're rolling out uh, this assurance methodology further um, under discussion because some of the other Martins and and uh, Jamie's committee, which we'll come to in a moment, they're, they're not as simple in a way, but uh, we're we're looking to move out further. So 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 with that, we'll we'll move on to the audit committee, Martin. Okay, I'll, I'll take the the, um, the paper as read, um, and just to point, you know, we have got with the switch over of external auditors um, from Grant Thornton to Deloitte, and that continues to go smoothly, and they've been very positive in reporting back that cooperation. So I think that's that's worked really well, and I appreciate that uh, Robert and his team have done a, a great job in making sure that handover um, works because it's not always smooth. It was fairly light um, uh, session in terms of internal audit reports, although the only area that we have 
really focused on is is some delays in getting some actions sorted, which is very rare for us. So we, we are asked for a renewed focus on making sure that the uh, internal audit board actions are, are done swiftly and promptly and appropriate to, to the outcome. Uh, other than that, there's no um, issues to raise. Okay, quite <coughs> Any questions? Yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously not just me getting that noise as well. Uh, if there's no questions, then if we can note that report, please, and move on to the Mental Health Collab. Jamie. Well, by contrast, this seems a, a very old fashioned way of reporting. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it, but I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things that were. Uh, we are now getting regular reports and you'll see that we gave the, the assurance levels limited assurance because of the uh, concerns about the risk of Section 117 costs and the increasing spend on out of area placements. Uh, Natalie prepared for us uh, an initial quality report, which is great. It's, it's early days. It's an evolving picture, like many of the things to do with the collaborative. They start off being uh, focused on the trusts uh, and thereafter grow to cover other parts of the NHS and thereafter grow to cover uh, wider partnerships. And the quality report is is on that journey. So we'll we'll give it an assurance level once it's widened its breadth of, of coverage. I just wanted to mention a couple of things um, that weren't for assurance, but, uh, but I know the board colleagues will be interested in. Uh, at the last time I spoke about the uh, mental health outcomes framework and how there was a little bit of frustration that we weren't measuring the right things. Uh, there's what I think is very uh, creative, um, big piece of work being carried out now to look at uh, more more inventive ways to uh, measure and provide metrics on on the outcomes we're really trying to achieve. And I, was, I was very I was reassured that this is this is going in the right direction now. Thank you for your suggestions last time, Martin, about uh, good practice places we could follow up with, which um, that has happened. So um, I'm I'm confident there's going to be a, a good quality piece of work on that at the next meeting. Also to mention that the West Midlands Provider Collaborative, uh, this is mainly focusing on specialist areas of mental health delivery, is now uh, now really motoring. It was I, I thought it was a relatively early slow start earlier this year, but it's now doing a, a, a great deal of work identifying areas for cooperation and collaboration. Uh, and we're involved in several of those, particularly around issues to do with capacity and resource planning uh, across mental health services. So that's a positive development. Sarah and Sue are representing us on that. I'll, I'll leave it there and happy to take any questions. And the next time you hear from me on the Mental Health Collaborative at, in uh, uh, the January meeting, it will be colour coded like uh, like Steve's. There's, uh, I, I, I can definitely see some report envy going on here, which 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 is good. Um, thank you, Jamie. Does anybody have any questions? Only comment I would make, Jamie, that um, I had a, a very good meeting with the chair of Worcestershire Health Watch, Joe. And uh, she picked up with me the matter of uh, metrics for mental health. Um, and I'm pleased to see that your, your or the team are, are looking to address that so we can assess performance in that area uh, a little bit better. And uh, if the club that's picking that up, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and the final part before I have a, a break to go and refresh your cups is uh, the Mental Health Legislation Committee, Tessa. Thank you, Chair. We only received the one report, which is the, the normal report for this committee, because the focus of the session in October is always uh, training. So it was great to actually be physically present with the associate hospital managers to be able to thank them for the fact that they represent the non-executive directors by doing the hearings that they do and to hear from them. And one of the pieces that we did do during the um, afternoon was an equality, diversity and inclusion questionnaire. Listening to some of the conversations around the room as people filled them in, I think the responses might be quite illuminating and um, very useful. And um, Sammy uh, 
is going to come and uh, do a piece of work with them in the future around EDI issues. So it was a good afternoon and I think everyone valued the time for the training. Thanks, Tessa. If there are no questions, can we uh, all note that report? Yes, thank you. Um, my word, we appear to be on time. Uh, shall we take a break now and re re reconvene at quarter to 11? So uh, we'll re reconvene quarter to 11. Thank you. <laughs>